In the 90s, Flying Nun continued to put new bands on the label. But with Mushroom on board and Roger Shepard gone, the anarchic ways were over and a more professional approach prevailed. The label changed quite a lot right from when Mushroom kind of started buying into the company. And it was, um, yeah, it just sort of became that we had to consider a whole lot of sort of commercial imperatives. When I first joined Flying Nun, I thought the, the you know, they, I thought, you know, I mean, they kind of had indie alternative kind of vibes up there. And I didn't really know what that meant, you know, but I said, you know, I'm glad you like your music, but you know, I think it's probably going to sell a few records. And I said that almost apologetically. <laughs> Even though Flying Nun were now more professional than they ever had been, when Bircher Duper were being chased by every record company, it was Flying Nun's ability to still promise a less corporate approach, tied with its legacy, that won Bircher Duper to their label. It was quite strange being on Flying Nun with the band, not really knowing much about Flying Nun, and, and it was really cool. I, I felt really, you know, privileged to be on a pretty legendary label worldwide, really. It's, it's pretty renowned for being... Um, a unique New Zealand label and it was cool to be involved in that and everybody that worked there was we thought at the time really into it I'm sure they were but you never know because we were just these little 16 year old boys Some like to sit on the floor Others like to rush out the door I think Betcha Dupu were probably happy to be with Flying Nun because they felt that we, we were never going to pressure them to, to make being son of Neil Finn a big issue I'm the one who's look out for this year. I never wanted It was a good feeling to be on a label that we felt was down on our level. You know, it wouldn't have worked, I don't think, with a bigger label that, that wanted to spend lots of money and get us into heaps of debt, which we're not about. We're a simple, raw rock and roll band. It doesn't take us, you know, we shouldn't have to record $100,000 albums because we're not that kind of band. I think Flying Nun's definitely on that level. I think Flying Nun's got a reputation of good quality New Zealand music. Um, no bullshit, you know, it's kind of, we've got that Kiwi ethic about it. Um, not flash, but, but cool. Uh, reputation for putting out good music consistently for 21 years. In that 21 years, Flying Nun has released records by more than 150 New Zealand artists. In the beginning, there were no role models for the company. Roger Shepard was winging it. Mistakes were made along the way, but what the unstructured creative approach led to was genuine original New Zealand music being recorded and released. A body of music that has gained international respect and still retains its importance today. I think what Flying Them was, was a, a huge blossoming of something uniquely New Zealand that had not a sound, but a, a philosophy behind it, which is do it yourself, a little bit of the punk splashed in, um, something that nobody else was doing in the world and thinking, Christ, this is great. Well, I think looking back on that, there was, I mean, it's, it, I guess you could say it's part, a little tiny part of the culture now, I guess what happened there in Dunedin in the early 80s. I think the success has been in a creative sense rather than a commercial sense um, because there have been some amazingly um, important creative records made, records that have influenced people overseas, but commercially it's the records that the Flying Nun artists influence that have had the success rather than the Flying Nun records themselves. Clean and the Chills, and in particular I think, and Tall Dwarfs, um, started a whole lot of careers of people who you know, became so much bigger than any Flying Nun band ever did. So that sort of thing has had an impact upon the people who follow those bands as well, because they read the interviews and, you know, these names get dropped and they go, oh, gosh, Steve Milkmus likes 
The Clean. Well, I'd better find out about them. I mean, The Clean and Tall Dwarfs were like, they were considered, you know, to this group of our ten friends to be just these really important bands, which is, it's, they, they, I mean, they are, but it's probably funny to imagine in, like, rural Virginia. Playing nuns like this continual, almost this continual struggle in a way to keep putting out records. So maybe its defining achievement is the fact that it's still here. So golden moments sort of come and go through that. You know, maybe the golden moment is when you can pay the bills. It wasn't, you know, about making money or turning it into a into a successful business and um, reaping the rewards. It was very much like, you know, this music's really interesting. We've really got to get it out and let's get on with it. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.